Get back to Hello, work. everybody. Back and how's everybody doing tonight? Turn the music up just a little bit. There we go. Maybe just a little down a little bit more. There we go. Yes, Creeping Death, we are we are good for a show tonight. It should be a lot of fun. I am, of course, the Cranky Canuck. Uh, I am joined tonight for Late Night with Cranky and Friends by the good old Red Mage sitting down in Hamilton, Ontario, a little south of me, and by the youngest member of the Late Night crew, Dark Devil. Thank you for joining hey. us, Dark. Now, we were supposed to have the gall in, but son came up and, and he had to uh, he had to sort of abscond himself from, from the show. So Red jumped in. Thank you very much for that, dude. Okay. Um, now, I'm gonna be a little self serving here because I, I got I got new toys today and I just I've gotta get used to them. But to give you an idea, um, I'll throw throw a link into chat. That's that's my new setup. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm having to get used to getting used to three screens. It's a little difficult. New headphones, new mouse. Um, much of it thanks to a really good lead from De Gaulle, which saved me a lot of money, um, which I, I really appreciate because, hey, I don't make a lot of money. Um, how are you guys tonight? How, how's, how's Dark Devil down there in, in, in... Whereabouts are you, Dark, exactly? Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia. So you're you're in the chill zone too, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, record low. Record low. What? It got down to minus two. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how low it got. Oh, uh, and of course, Red and I are, are sitting in in Ontario, which is you know getting blasted by a cold front as usual in this time of year. But yeah. yeah, so but anyway, um, let's let's get off with with to a, a typical start. Twitch had a, a huge announcement today, Ooh. absolutely huge announcement. And we were sitting around uh, Disney Disasters Teamspeak. We were you know sort of anticipating we were going to watch it live on their on their Twitch Weekly show, and we were hoping, hoping against hope, that. You know, we would we would see maybe no delay stream chat. You know, better ingest servers. You know, something tech oriented to make you know streamers' life easier and our our chat our our folks in chat their life a little easier. But no, what do we get? TwitchCon. Now. Yay. As our resident American here, Dark, how does how does the idea of Twitch having a TwitchCon in San Francisco rock your boat? Oh my God! Biggest announcement I've ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. By the way, in case anybody doesn't know, Dark Devil is a king of semantic sarcasm. Okay, you do not want to argue with that little twerp because he'll cut you to pieces. <laughs> um. What did you, what did you th like? What was your reaction, Red, when when you when you heard this amazing announcement, which was, by the way, pre, you know, preluded to by another announcement of the Twitch purple hoodies being on Amazon. Oh yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> it, it's it's to quote my best friend. <laughs> no. <laughs> it, so what? It's another con. It's another. Uh, it, like we've got PAX, we've got PAX Prime, PAX East, we've got uh, E3, which I wouldn't really call a con, anyways. Um, God knows how many comic conventions and sci-fi conventions and brony conventions. And do we really need another? Like, well, it's it's for all the Twitchers and the Twitch community to pull together and have a good time. Here, here actually, here's a better idea. How about like a Twitch community? Well, you know, like say Fall Zone plan something together, rent a space out, and have that community who are like-minded individuals get together and, and share the love for the community, as opposed to uh, what I'm going to assume, because this is the first year, is probably going to be a bit of a cluster buck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, now, okay, see, so here's the thing. They have a name. 
they have a date, which is September 25th and 26th, and they have a location, the Moscone West Center in San Francisco, which ain't no cheap venue, by the way, because that's one the same one that Apple always takes over, but, you know, the Moscone Center is not a fucking cheap, cheap place to hold a, a venue. Um, but they have no content for the con yet. Like, None. That's that's the hard sell. It's like, what are they gonna do? It's it's not like, you know, packs where they can have panels on, you know, cosplay, game design. Um, the guys in Penny Arcade every morning apparently do, like, how they create a comic every day, every yeah. day of the con. So there, there's a lot of um, content they can whip up pretty quick and get from other developers or people in the industry. This how to set up overlays, how to design overlays, how to... Like, I can see where they can go with it, but I, it's just one of those things, like, how, how much could they actually hey, you put you know in? what we could have? A live version of Dropped Frames. You know, <laughs> the, the show where all the, you know, the four big boys of Twitch get together and recommend how the rest of us should do it. And by the way, eyes do a search on Amazon... For Twitch hoodie, you'll find it. It's there already. Um, yeah, so you know, th there we go. That that's the first one they could have, and we can all get bowed down on our hands and knees to these great Twitch, you know, streaming gods, and and say thank you for saving us. We now we know what we're doing wrong. Um, Dark, what like what would you want to see at a TwitchCon? Um, I'm not sure what I'd want to see because. There's not much to see there. I'm pretty sure it's just going to be VidCon, except for Twitch. They're just going to have meet and greets and interviews with streamers. Yeah, it's... I just... I, I don't... I don't... I do not get it. I do not get it at all. Um, but, hey, you know, Twitch is growing. You know, it's... It, I guess it makes sense from a marketing and promotional point of view. It may, gives it a bigger visible name in the pop culture community because the people that are actually handling the venue are an agency that does a lot of pop culture type events. So I, I, I guess that kind of works. I, I, I don't know. But in, anyway, um, uh, Yesterday, we were talking about Magic Amy, uh, who is a Hearthstone player, and some of you might remember the story, uh, who was accused of being not one, but two people. Um, she was basically asked to uh, suspend any playing of Hearthstone through Team Temple, uh, Temple Storm. Um, as of today... Temple Storm has parted ways with its, with its South Korean player, Hiram Magic Amy Lee, following what is described on the team's website as a full-blown investigation gathering a large amount of evidence from dozens of sources, including former employees, ex-teammates, fellow players, and personal friends. She has parted ways on based on absolutely fuck all. And they even point that out. They have no proof. But for the betterment of the team, she's decided to leave. Um, they go on to say, uh, Hiram's performance and accomplishments as a player have been uh, called into question due to the possibility of an account boosting and win trading. Terreri was identified as a possible accomplice under suspicious circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence. Uh, such as when she posted a picture showing an account named Love Magic Amy as ranked number one, indirectly applying it was her achievement. Later it was confirmed by Terraria that he used his own account and then renamed it to Love Magic Amy. Um, my bowl of popcorn is the kitchen. I forgot it. <laughs> that's what this is like. Is any of this making any sense at all? Like, I... No, <laughs> it doesn't. Like, like, who gives a shit? She put a camera on her, and someone else did the work. Who gives a shit? 
Yeah, but that's not sportsmanlike, Dark. But, <clears throat> like... <laughs> okay, there's there's more speculation and assumption in there I feel comfortable with from a uh, statement that is billed as the final word on the matter. But I suppose that's the nature of things given whatever investigation has occurred has been conducted across continents and carried out by detectives who are by definition amateurs. Um, my understanding from talking to Temple Storm is the investigation was handled by team founder Audrey uh, Renard uh, Yanyuk and VP of Operations Dan Froden Chow. As for why the split occurred, this paragraph appears to be a telling one. Upon learning the, the entire story, Temple Storm offered to fully support Magic Amy in an attempt to clear her name by addressing the public immediately by having her compete in an offline tournament. Hiram, however, has decided to take a leave of absence from Hearthstone and answer these issues on her own. So basically, Team, Stem Team Tempo or S Temple Storm said, look, prove your, your, you know, this is all true, that you are who you are by competing in an off-stream competition that will, will, that will be monitored. And everything gets all cleared up. Like I, this is the one thing I don't understand is that they 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 have this say hey we're going to fully support you hey even take the time to do an offline tournament to clear your name and they're like nope nope don't want to disappear like it, this this would be like a sport equivalent <clears throat> here comes a hockey reference um, of someone let's say like uh, back when the Leafs had Manal Realm the the first female goalie in the NHL. They have interviews with her. You can clearly see her face. But when it comes to game time, you can't see her face. And it's actually, you know, like Patrick Waugh behind the mask. This is the equivalent of what she's doing. Yeah. Is that she's being the face for the, the, the character and someone else is pulling the strings. Like that, like I said the other night, it's a misrepresentation of who you are as a person and as, as a player. But you, but Dark, you, uh, you you don't really see anything wrong with that kind of idea. No, because competitive. Okay, we're losing your audio there, Dark. On anonymous. Yeah. Do you do you want to try repeating that? Because I think we lost your audio a little bit. Um, what I was saying is, like, it may not be a. It may be competitive, but it's still a game. If someone doesn't want credit for what they're doing, go ahead and let them say it's someone else doing the work. Like, it, it depends on if the, the person uh, in front of the camera is forcing the person behind it to do this, or if the person behind the camera. So, let's say, for example, they came out and said, okay, yeah, we're a team. She's a face. I'm the hands, and made it public that yeah it was two people on one account. Isn't that still against the spirit of the game? But there's no like advantage to having two people on the same account. They're not both playing the game. Only one of them is still playing. So it's her face on the camera, but some dude actually clicking the mouse button that's what I get from, from this and that doesn't that doesn't bother you at all not really you, know, you can never have that person in an uh, in-person tournament it, it won't happen like it, like I said, it, it's this story is just whole full chock full of stupid from the get-go as it is like the, this whole thing we're following because of this whole idea that this person is saying Oh, this is who I am, but the hands aren't mine. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like uh, it, it, it's it's one of these things where in esports, in, in this type of setting where you don't always have to be physically there and present, um, it's probably the only place you could get away with something like this if this is exactly what is going on. Because again, this is allegedly, and as they say in law, burden of proof is on prosecution. Yeah, so, but, but here's the thing, uh, you know, we don't have definite proof. We don't. 
We have exactly. a lot of supposition. We have a lot of, of rumor. We have a lot of he said, she said. The, the Really, the only ones that can tell, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, are her and Blizzard. Because, mm-hmm. like, have you played Hearthstone Dark Devil? Yeah, I played a bit of it. Okay, now, if I understand correctly, if, if you're logged in, your IP is in with that game, right? You can't have somebody else in on top of you on the same, like, like... It wouldn't be possible if you're in two different places, you know, the face and the yeah. hands. Like, Blizzard yeah, I know, would know. Um, Blizzard won't even let you be logged into the same account from two different computers. Mm. I know me and my I dad mean, both play, uh, uh, what is it, Diablo, and he uses my account, but I get kicked off as soon as he logs in and vice versa. So, you know, like, but Blizzard, Blizzard isn't saying anything about this. They're, they're just standing there going, blah, 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 blah. We don't know nothing about, like, they're, they're not getting involved in this. This is, this is pure team crap. No. And here's the other thing I just thought of when you mentioned that. What if the guys were uh, using, like, a remote desktop tool as well? So he may not even be physically there, but he could be somewhere else in the world doing remote, remote controlling. The yeah, but the too. ping on that would be insanely bad. Yeah, it's true, but it's just one of those other and like if, if, yeah, but you know, and, and like going with that idea, if if you're if you're remote desktoping in, you you just you can't you can't play serious competition any kind of serious competition game because the ping would just be a killer. Right. Well, at least with Hearthstone, they they give, do give you it's some time to to play your hand. Like it's like I think it's about a minute um, before your hand's forced to the other person. So it, it's not always like you have to instantly react. Uh, um, you know, some people will take a moment or two and think about their move and their well, like, corresponding moves after. <clears throat> Script Monkey says Hearthstone isn't time based. Uh, lag wouldn't real matter really. Yeah. You know so. Yeah. Like, like I said, you could take about a minute to, to make your your play, use up all your mana, and then pass the turnover. Or, you know, if you know exactly what your next five moves are going to be and how to counter whatever they're doing, you can just bang out your cards and hit end turn and you're gone. Yeah. So. <clears throat> um, by the way, I'm getting a kick out of people trying to figure out how old you are, Dark. And <laughs> it's it's funny because they don't know you very well. They don't know you at all. They don't know how fucking smart you are or how good of a, a gamer you are. So, you know, it's 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 kind of funny to, to, to watch this going by. Um, one of the other horses we like to kick around every once in a while is Kickstarter. See what I did there? Um, especially when it comes to stuff that doesn't meet its funding or doesn't get launched. But there is a, a post out today um, that listed 12 successful Kickstarters, gaming-related Kickstarters, that never delivered. Now, we're not going to go through all of them, but we'll, we'll go through a, you know, a few of them and kind of you know, get your opinions on what you think of whether, whether they should have been even funded in the first place. Um, the, the first one up is called Aurora... Aurora tactics they earned uh, eleven thousand five hundred and seventy seven dollars they were funded april 6 2012 with an estimated delivery date of may 2012 doesn't give a fuck of a lot of time all right that should have been like warning number one um it's unclear why or attack tactics which promised to be a tactical rpg with asynchronous multiplayer disappeared with over eleven thousand dollars but their last kickstarter update was in january of 2013. in november 2013 creator douglas millis miller uh um, wrote a comment saying that the members of the team had been laid off and were looking for new work at that time miller promised that the game would, was not cancelled but a year and a half later it's still mm mia um 
like I said, we don't know a lot about the game other than the fact that it was an asynchronous multiplayer uh, tactical RPG. Now, here's the question. $11,000. That wouldn't even get a, a good artist paid. So why do you think that this actually got its funding amount? Like, are people that stupid that they're gonna go? Yes, we're gonna we're gonna donate to the we're gonna we're gonna and be, understand that's what you're doing on Kickstarter. You're funding, you're donating your money to them. You don't you know don't expect anything back. Um, but like I said earlier, like the estimated delivery date was a month a month later. Well, I think that's that's when it was fully funded. No, it was funded um, April six. Well, that's what I mean. It was funded April 6th, and a month later, it's an estimated delivery date. How long was the Kickstarter up for previously, and how much of work did they do before they started the Kickstarter? Those are the two questions that, that aren't exactly answered here either. Because um, <clears throat> they, just... they could have been working on it for a year prior to that, you know, started the Kickstarter, let's say, in January, and then it funded finally in April. You know, like that, that's, that's a possibility, but still the estimated delivery date of may 2012 and okay still not there's, around there's the oh, no wrong link sorry guys that's not the one i wanted um control a copy let's try and do this again there we go that's that's the kickstarter for the game okay and it's an independently developed tactical RPG for mobile and web, featuring class swapping and asynchronous multiplayer. We are not vaporware, we promise. You can actually go play our game. We are only showing off a proof of, proof of concept, dev jargon for, rough example, but hey, that's the game works. Due to visual constraints, all, in, all of the in-game art was created over a period of two weeks. No. Like dark, would you, would you would you put your well okay, you you, you don't maybe make hard earned money yet, but <laughs> would you put your hard earned money into something like this with like two weeks worth of artwork? No. <laughs> Never. Like their last update on their Kickstarter page is January of twenty thirteen. Oh no, sorry. February thirteenth, twenty thirteen. We've now come a f past a full year, and there hasn't been anything past that yeah. point. So, like, <laughs> this almost sounds like taking the money and run kind of situation with these guys. I, I, I it, listen. Oh, what I think was somebody wanted a party weekend. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's basically <laughs> what that was all about. They just wanted a weekend where they could party and and not have to pay the bill afterwards. Okay, the next one up, and this this was not so much a game itself, but a game space, okay? A physical building called LA Game Space. Now, they earned $335,657. It was funded uh, December 7th, 2012, with an estimated delivery date of a physical building where they would have gaming events for May 2013. That's a lot of money that people put into that. That is, and the, what are they trying to do? Like a uh, like an esports stadium type the, thing? The LA spa game space was envisioned as a place for discovering the potential of video games that would host exhibitions, stream games, and facilitate indie development. In other words, you know how they have, <coughs> have um, hacker spots? Or your maker spaces. M maker spaces. Yeah. Okay. This was, I think this was the kind of idea they had for, for, for gaming. Like, Dark, would you go to a place like that? Like, would that be, like, to me, that would be an awesome place to go to if it was done right. What about you? I mean, they have 
place is kind of like that, where you just, it's basically a land area. But this seems taking that to the next level, which I'm not, it seems like streamer house combined with some sort of, uh, you know, like the land places where you can go and they just have a shit ton of computers. Yeah, and building, like, the infrastructure and buildings is not cheap. Nope. Now, and this is, this is in L.A., which, again, imagine. you know, um, just so that how many of Kickstarters did, don't meet their deadlines? My, my uh, fiancé funds them a lot, and three out of four are late, so maybe people just don't look, look at the dates anymore. True enough. True enough, Script Monkey. That, you know, I, I think they they see something and it, it it's the the thing about Kickstarter that that worries that kind of bothers me is its spontaneous donation. Like if you come here, you're not expected you know to donate. You come here for a week, two weeks, and you suddenly decide, hey, I like my I like spending my time here. I like and and, and or you go to. You know, Total Biscuit. You like spending your time there. You want to show your support. So you donate. This Kickstarter, to me, is sort of drive-by donation. You see an idea. You read through this prepped and fancy videos. And you go, yeah, I'm going to kick in some money for that. Because I might get something out of it. The actual return, it would probably surprise a lot of people. I don't have the actual numbers. I, I know because I've looked at it before, but I don't have the actual numbers. But the actual successful Kickstarters that backers actually see a return, whether it be goods or services or whatever, is not as common as people like to think. Like, have you ever... Have you ever I, I don't even know if you, you, you can, Derek, but, but but would you kickstart a project? Oh, uh, yeah. There have been a few I've thought of kickstarting, but just didn't have money at the time. Why, though? Why would you kick? Why would you jump in on a Kickstarter? What was it about them that said, okay, I'm willing to commit to that? Well, the only ones I've thought about committing to weren't even, like, games or video games. They were, like, board games or card sets like those i'm pretty willing to trust they will get made because i know there have been so many of those that are made that are extremely well made like i personally own a few different board games that were kickstarted and they're some of the best board games i own and yeah do you th and I, I, I'm asking all this with script, script monkey because he's he, uh, he's funded a couple he's been successful but because he's researched the person do you think people do enough research when it comes to Kickstarter <coughs> projects especially gaming projects because they are fundamentally um, flawed projects you you cannot give a timetable on 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 games you just can't. No, because you, you can't foresee what kind of hurdles you're going to have to jump through to, to get it completed. Bugs, uh, data loss, anything like that. And like it, I, I, Script Monkey makes a good point. Like he's researched the the person funding it or you know the the company, and kind of did his due diligence before throwing money at it. You know, there I know there's some people I know of that. Um, one of my friends has probably spent close to two hundred dollars helping back the new shadow run that they're doing and he, I, I was talking to him and he says i probably shouldn't have spent this much but uh, you know i really want to see this happen I'm like oh, okay but it, it's something they have a proven track record that they are going to complete it and they even state in their video we're going to get this done your funding is going to add in more things to the game that so we can have more uh, like more extras, more, more parts to the story, this and this and this and this. So their their model is amazing because they say, hey, you already are guaranteed a product, but how much more in the product is up to you guys. 
a lot of these places are just saying we're in the process and we don't have a hard this is our kind of date that we want to get it out it's like well if we go by blizzard's logic of their <clears throat> soon trademarked <laughs> yeah you know like we'd never see half these things and that's the the problem with kickstarter is that it's a lot of it's a great unknown if you don't know who you're dealing with yeah okay well, one one where we where they definitely didn't know what they were dealing with um was unwritten that which happens it earned seventy eight thousand and seventeen dollars it was funded february 13th 2013 estimated delivery august 20th 2013 um side note a lot of these seem to have very short ship dates for games like Anybody that's done coding, anybody that's done development, you're looking at uh, March, April, May, June, July, August, you're looking at, what, six months to code a game? Fuck you. I, I could see a year. Minimum. <clears throat> minimum for, for minimum. most games. You know, and a lot of these AAAs uh, take minimum at least and these guys have huge teams working on it though and a lot of these kickstarters don't have that kind of manpower no anyway it, so go ahead go ahead dark that's that's pretty much exactly why i'd probably never fund a video game stuff like board games they generally don't go to kickstarter until they have the design down all they need to do is produce them solid point that's a solid point um, anyway, with, with Unwritten, what happened was, like, after raising $78,000 for his roguelike procedural strategy game at the beginning of 2013, project lead Joe Houston wrote in January 2014, already well past the ship date, uh, that his family had been struggling with medical issues and they had run out of money to complete the project. Houston says the game is still happening, but backers have been frustrated with the lack of updates over the, over the past year. Um... Kotaku reached out to him, and he says the game is still in production, but, you know, he's, you know, real life has, has like, kind of kicked him in the balls, and, and he just, you know, he's had to deal with it. Now, it's easy to say life has kicked me in the balls when, you know, you've got 78 grand in the bank. He very well could have had his balls kicked in, but, you know, I kind of want to see some proof. Yeah, not to be a dick about it, but yeah, I agree you know, there. Like, I'm sorry, dude, but it, you know, you know, you've had hard times. We all have hard times, but you've got 78 grand of our money, and you say there's nothing left for production. So, give us something to, um, yeah, watch the 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 length of your your post there, script monkey. That's the bot that does that. Uh, split it in half if if you have to. Um, the whole world gone crazy! Thank you, Blue Star. The only one around here gives a shit about the rules. But yeah, I I, I kind of want to see some proof. Like, there's no accountability with this, none at all. Yeah, I think that's that's the major problem with a lot of these that we're seeing, at least in this list, is that the, the they're saying it has been an update in a year. The other one, no update in a year again. Like, there's. There's no transparency in what's going on, and that's what a lot of people would expect from when they're giving them the, their hard-earned money to help fund a project like this. Yeah, you know, like I've known people who've done Kickstarters or Indiegogos who needed help raising money to put together a new rig for their uh, their broadcasting or what have you, and <clears throat> they raised the amount of money they needed, and they actually went out. And here's the list of what we need to get. And when they got everything, they actually took a picture of the whole receipt and posted it so that people knew exactly what the money was spent on. So, it, it, again, this is the one problem with Kickstarter no accountability, like you said, and there's no communication either. Yeah. I, I got you, Nick. Just one second. I, I've, I, got, I got your text. Just hang on a minute and I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it so you don't get 
too frustrated. I understand. It's Nightbot. It's it's like an automatic thing. The text is too long, and it will kick your ass out of out of chat. Um, what uh, Nick B said. Um, I said this before uh, before the card game Hex on Kickstarter just got as much money as Stardison, yet Hex delivered all delivered already delivered tenfold compared to Star Citizen when they started at the same time. Granted, one is a space sim and the other is a card game, but there's a lot that has to go into making and balancing over 500 cards at their launch. The beta thing is already out. I bet Star Citizen will come out in 2016 as a basic beta with limited functions. Um, yeah, you're, 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 you're pretty well on the money there, Nick. You know, I... I I will admit, I have not been a fan of Star Citizen. I basically called it a Ponzi scheme when I was writing about it on, on Cranky Gamers. Um, and I still get that feeling with the game. Because we're not seeing a complete project. The guy's got 50 million fucking bucks. Alright? And we've got what? One playable module? Maybe two? That's does not make a game no. you know um, but yeah it's I'm not even gonna bother going cuz like gone crazy! thank you for falling I'm spice um, Kickstarter is a great concept I like the concept you know being able to help fund people with people's dreams Right, like for for um, podcasters and bloggers and other people, there there is um, uh, Paterian, which is a great way to support that end of it. Twitch, we've got the sub buttons, which I don't have and I probably won't have for a long while. But and then there's the donations. Um, but for you know developers, for artists, for you know people with dreams, Kickstarter is a valuable tool. The problem I have is that A, there is, there is no built-in accountability for delivering a product. Right, and that, that's the, I agree. That's the biggest problem. Is they don't have a mandate to force the, the, per, the person starting the Kickstarter to, to, um, to provide you know, a finished product. And that's the, like I said, the, the idea and the concept is amazing. And, uh, and I've seen the other sites like Indiegogo, uh, you know, help fund people who like really need the money for, you know, uh, things like, um, <clears throat> like medical treatments that are like urgently required or uh, any other thing like that. <laughs> But it's just for some reason Kickstarter is getting such a bad rap because of this, because there's yeah. no accountability and there's no uh, repercussions for not producing a product. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, one thing that does not need a Kickstarter, and that's Counter Strike Global Offensive. Like it's, I, I, I know, Dark, you are our resident CS:GO pro. Okay, like. Don't go up against this kid with a knife, because he'll he'll slice you and dice you. Um, but ESL is hosting what it says will be the largest Counter Strike Global Offensive tournament in the world this summer, uh, the big indoor arena in Germany. It also promised that 2015 will see see more CS:GO action than any previous year in ES, ESL's history. Um, the Cologne tournament. We'll see 16 teams battling for $250,000 in prize money, which will be funded entirely by ESL. Um, so when are you signing up, Dark? For what? <laughs> for the this tournament? Yeah, yeah. Like oh, I'm signing up. I'm already signed up. I got, got a team. You got to represent, man. You got to represent, represent us. You know, like we, we you know, we, we, we need this. Um, what do you think of this idea of like major? Like, we've seen esports where CSGO has been a, a part of the overall competition. But this is taking it one step up and saying it's the centerpiece. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I like it in a way. Like I know there's other games that are have a bigger draw, but this is one of these things that's been a long time coming for them for Counter Strike in general. Because um, normally you see a lot of these tournaments is you know Counter Strike and Halo, and then whatever else usually like StarCraft or StarCraft Two. And those tend to be the bigger ones. Now to have this one as the center stage, good for them. You know, the fact that I'm amazed at the fact that they actually built something specifically for that. And, you know, if, if it's gonna, as long as it stays standing, they use it for other events as well, which is good. They'll have something permanent, a permanent fixture for that kind of event. What do you think, Dark, of this, of this kind of, of growth of CSGO as, as a major competitive esport on its own? Rather than being sort of combined with other ones, is 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 that is the, like I don't pl- I don't play CS:GO. It's like not even interesting. I know De Gaulle is a game he hates, but he plays every night. Same with G, you know. Um, but you seem to love the game, and especially when you can knife people in the back. <laughs> yeah, I I love the uh, the fact that they're just growing and growing. They've had big tournaments but none that are gonna be nearly as big as this it it gives it brings respect to the gaming community to have all these separate competitions and shit like if, if you had a chance would you go i i would love to go to a like any esport major tournament that even for one i don't like that just be a great atmosphere i feel like Hmm. Um, anyway, uh, the the uh, ESL One Cologne is going to be the largest Counter Strike global offensive event in the world, taking place in the largest indoor arena in Germany. Uh, it will take place at a twenty thousand seat um, Lenexus Arena in Cologne on August twenty second to twenty third. Tickets to the event will go on sale on February twenty third. Um, now, just as a note, uh, through um, my uh, center stage show, if they are, are live streaming it, we'll be covering it. Um, but he, here's, here's the thing, and I, I'm waiting to hear someone be knocking at your door to, to do some checking up on making sure that uh, you're not cheating when you're playing CSGO. Um, but apparently, like, I have to be honest. I, I read this, and my first reaction was, this has to be an Onion post. Okay? Now, I don't know if, if people in chat are familiar with The Onion, but it is one of the largest and best done satirical parody sites on the web. Especially when it comes to tech and, and everything like this. Um, but, yeah. Um, apparently, uh, who is it? it it's... I guess Valve and is teaming up with a company by the name of Faceit. And what Faceit does is it basically sends out CSGO police if the you're... Whole world gone crazy. Thank you, Die Poop. The only I love that name, yes. Um, if you are a competitive player, not if you're just, you know, Joe Blow hacking away, but if you're a competitive CSGO player, and you're in competitions, you can expect a visit from Face It, knocking on your door, because they're going to come in, and they're going to be checking your computer for cheats, hacks, the whole works, okay? Um, as it says here, all players must be subject to visits from Face It admins to inspect their computers for cheats and or obs- observe them playing an official match. Inspections may happen at random and may not necessarily suggest a suspicion of cheating. To be clear, what we are saying is we may turn up at your house. Yes, we are serious. <laughs> what the flying fuck? <laughs> well, you know what? The, the sports has drug testing and you know what? That We're... We're at a point where, from what I understand, like one of my friends he was huge into Counter Strike, like 1.6, and could have went competitive. Um, 
the aimbots, a lot of the cheating programs are so much harder now to detect. It used to be that you'd have the gun facing at their gut and it would zip right up to their head as the shot gets made. Now it's literally, you're aiming here and it'll shoot over a pixel or two just to hit the, the proper hit mark or hit box. So because it's that, uh, that small, replays are basically almost ineffective at this point to, Must be to catch it. Oh no, what happened, Dark? We lost you, Dark. <laughs> we lost you. Come back to us. Come back to us, Dark. Did we lose my... Yeah, we lost my team speak, too. Oh, it looks like it uh, had a delay on his kickoff. Well, you, you know what it is. And I wish... we. I, I, I really hate Skype and its little merit. Because I'm being blocked off by an error message now in Skype. Hi, how are you? I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, yeah, see, there's a running joke in TeamSpeak every night at 10 o'clock during the week. No matter what Dark is doing, he will suddenly uh, be out. He'll, like he'll drop right out of, of TeamSpeak. He'll right out, drop right out of whatever games it is he's in. Um, that's because his parents have parental controls on the router, <laughs> and it's a shut off at ten o'clock. Within five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> He is back. There we I, go. I can't Dark. even be the parental controls because it's twelve forty-three. <laughs> Apparently, the router's running on P a little bit early on PSC's time there. <laughs> oh God. Um. So not only do we have to to, to bug you about uh you know the ten o'clock uh dropout. Now we can bug you about face it knocking on your door. <laughs> because you being the CSGO player and most likely to go pro, they're coming for you, Dark. <laughs> like, what do you think about that? As, as, as a CSGO player, and I, granted, you don't play competitively on that level, right? I know you do play mm -hmm. competitively, but not on, on the, the pro level. What do you think of that idea of actually... A company coming into your home to make sure you're you're legit. It it's a very interesting idea. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how well they'd be able to actually enforce that. Like how many admins they have at Face It, how much it costs to enforce that. I know they get huge funding in these. They do tournaments with huge uh payouts but something that large just randomly inspecting people's homes across the world i i i will not accept any awesome i will not yeah well see here's the thing you, you're dealing with um big money okay like these tournaments you know they're, they're millions of dollars are being spent on them prize monies are climbing and climbing and climbing I don't think a budget is much of a worry for Face It. Like, if if they figure that they've... The problem is, I don't... It pro, the, What bothers me is that they think they have that right. Like, you're again, you're automatically being assumed... Regardless of what they say. You're being assumed, if they show up on your, on your door... That there's this, there, there, there is that thought that you are, you're a professional CS:GO player. We've got to make sure that you're clean. Well, as they said in a, the interview with uh, Kotaku, they say it's only if you're in the extremely professional competitive leagues for them, and you sign a contract stating that you are okay with this. And what happens if you don't want it? What happens if you're not okay with it? Are you suddenly out of it? Like, 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 and, and that to me is not right. I mean, it's the same as any NFL official, say, random drug testing on a athletic sports player. It's essentially the same as that. 
Yeah, because they, they, if they de deny the, for the test or refuse to, they'll get pulled, you know, or, or fined or what have you. So this is kind of putting in a, a sporting style repercussions to cheating and you know steroid use and other performance enhancers uh, are considered cheating in a lot of these sports so in a way this is a really good thing because they have they're saying you know what we're going to actively and proactively check on this whether you're doing it or not like like a random drug test uh, as opposed to just letting it go and you know, letting the cheap cheating be rampant, which, in my experience playing uh, Counter Strike 1.6 and, and Source, cheating is brutal. Like uh, the speed hacks are insane. Like I've seen people clear maps in two seconds, like from one spawn to another. So there, it, it has been a long-standing problem, and it's good to see that they're at least doing something about it. You know, it's it's, it's interesting to watch the reaction to chat and, and to and, and to you guys talking about this. And and the more I'm seeing is that esports is a sport, and it's 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 being expected that the people that are partaking in that sport be treated like athletes and be be you know held accountable the same as professional athletes. And I I actually think think that think that's pretty incredible. I think that's pretty awesome, actually. Um, we've come a long way as far as, because really esports, esports is a new phenomenon. It's what, maybe 10, 10, 12 S years, if that? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's, as, as far as a sports sport, it's, it's a baby. Mm-hmm. But it is growing so fast, and I cannot look. I may not like the idea of someone knocking on my door and saying, "We want to watch you play a game. To make sure you're, you're, you know, you're clean. We want to check your computer. It's, it's gonna. We're gonna make sure your computer's clean." Um, it may bother me, but that's that's the tech in me. That's the old shit in me. You know, like you don't touch my fucking machine. Like I've gone up against the Canadian government on "Don't touch my fucking machine." All right. Um, but I, I can understand why this is happening, and I almost, I almost agree with it taking place. And so you know, and any negative thoughts I may have, I would rather put aside on the hope that esports, as it grows forward, gets bigger and is more respectable. And, and is a better representation of our gaming culture. But on that note, we're taking a five-minute break, folks. <laughs> I'm going to slide that one in real quick. Um, if you like what we, we, we're doing here at uh, you know Cranky Canuck and, and, and the shows that we're going to be doing, please consider hitting the old follow button. Um, let's us know we're doing something right. But for right now, we're going to take a five-minute break. And turn the music up just a little bit. And let you enjoy that. And uh, chat amongst yourself. We'll be back in five, everybody.
And we're coming back. We'll just turn the music down a little bit here, folks, and 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 we'll we'll get back to the conversation. A um, little bit of news came out. Yeah, like the other day we were talking about um, blizzard rumors, and one of the rumors was that the Diablo team was basically being gutted and and was 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 history. Now today, fuck sympathy. Thank you very much, Nick. Sympathy, man. I need Appreciate my that, Johnson. dude. Thank you very much. Um, uh, where the fuck was I now? I was going to pour myself a Pepsi. Yeah, we were talking about the fact that that Diablo was, you know, their team was, you know, nuked and and you know it was it might be going away. Now today. We have an announcement from the yeah, from from Blizzard um, about a, the the, the uh, Diablo 3 2.2 patch, which it will be coming very shortly to the public test realm, and it's bringing some rather inter like interesting stuff with it. And and as as a Diablo 3 player who is enjoying the game immensely since um, Reaper Souls fixed all the fucking shit that was in the game. Um, some of the new stuff that they're bringing, uh, there's going to be, um, new legendary, uh, new, new sets, uh, they've added new legendary level 70 armor sets, as well as redesigning the existence ones. Uh, the new sets are Unhallowed Essence, Wrath of the Waste, and, um, Dezelri's Magnus Opus. Um, they will appear for the Demon Hunter, Barbarian, and then Wizard character classes. Um, when it comes to uh, improvements or changes, uh, the existing sets like um, uh, Zunimasa's Haunt, uh, Raiment of the Thousand Storms, Roland's Legacy, Talrash's Elements, uh, Ina's Mantra, Natalia's Vengeance and the Immortal King's Call are getting uh, bonuses added to them, uh, redesigns added to them uh, to make them look better, I guess. Um, they're also going to be adding 15 new legendary item powers to the game. Uh, examples like the Barbarian's Boots will cause the ability Avalanche every time you use the, ground, uh, use the ability Ground Stomp. Uh, the Demon Hunter gloves causing Rain of Vengeance to deal a massive 84% increase in damage. Some, so it looks like they're they're doing some buffing of, of shit, you know, like putting stuff up there. Um, they're also adding uh, new Nephilim Rift areas and tile sets. Uh, there's 14 new exploration bounties to uh, revitalize adventure mode. There's three new types of treasure goblins coming. One's a blue gelatinous sire uh, that splits into smaller goblins. There's a golden gilded, uh, golden gilded baron for those you know gold hungry folks out there. And then there's the insufferable miscreant uh, who comes with friends. I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean, and you know nobody seems to know right now. What do you think? Um, I know you play Diablo 3 Dark, and I, I'm you, you play too, don't you, Red? Um, I actually haven't, at least not PC. I have it for Xbox 360 okay. without the uh, expansion. Okay. What do you guys think of, of these improvements, like or the, the, like this patch? Like, now the, to be clear, um, there is no class changes coming with this patch. So the classes are staying the same. It seems to be all around stuff that's being done. What do you think, Dark? Like, uh, Dark, you're uh, you're, you're muted. <laughs> I forgot. I muted both Skype and my headset. That, that's okay. I do that on a regular basis, so don't worry about it. Anyway, what do you think of the, of 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 the of this stuff? I'm very excited. Like. A lot of these sets like listed out there I have never even touched uh, because they just aren't worth using whatsoever and I'm glad they've decided to make it so there are more ways to play the game 
Like I, I, I know that Diablo three when it first launched was a disaster. Everybody said so, and it, it, it this wasn't just you know people bitching and complaining because it did. It sucked. There was a lot of problems with with Diablo three, and mainly I think it had to do with the fact that that Blizzard was owned by another company. Um, but since Reaper of Souls has come out, you're you're dealing with a company that actually owns its own IP again. That they, they like they're back in the game. I like to think, contrary to what, yeah, but I don't like. I've played Poe as well, script, and I, I, I have my problems with that game. Um, I like to to think that that uh, Diablo has a life again. What do you guys think? Like, is is there a possibility that a we might uh, what is it a PAX we might see a new expansion? You know, I'd hope so. I I, I kind of want to see them put a little more more longevity into this game. Um, like I, I I have the console experience. And I went through at least uh, on the first two difficulties with my Demon Hunter. Um, yeah, my, my father actually allows me to use his account to play it as well when he's not on. So I do get, I got a chance to put in about half an hour on a Barbarian this evening. So it, just getting into it, because we don't have the expansion on either. Yeah. So I'm getting the base game experience with all the updates still. Yeah. It's still a fun game. Like, you know, I haven't been able to play a Diablo game on the PC since the, well, Diablo 2. When it first came out, because I tried going back to it, and it's just it kind of doesn't hold up graphically as it used to. Yeah. But no, I, I'm I'm hoping that they put an expansion out more than just one, like they've always done. By the way, speaking of graphically, <laughs> um, who in chat today had a chance to watch Total Biscuit stream um, Homeworld remastered? I did. did. Oh, I, yeah, you were at school, Dark, or, or you should have been at school. Um, nope. Nope. You little jerk off. School you... canceled for record low temp. Dark, do you ever go to school? Oh, only in the U.S. Yeah. We Canada, had one day of school happen. today, or this week. One day of school this week. <laughs> and they wonder about why kids... In... Anyway, um, did you did you see it today? Like the Total Biscuit stream? I did not know what was going on until like it ended and you guys started talking about it. Oh man, oh man. I The, the first thing I did, it was about 20 minutes in, I checked my PayPal account to maybe hope that I could afford to, to, <laughs> to, to, to you know, pre, pre-purchase the game. It is fucking phenomenal. It's gorgeous. Like I was, you were talking about that and I'm like... Man, I'm really reconsidering that con- PC controller that I was going to buy for next week. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, like for it, right now uh, it's 32.95 uh, pre-purchase Canadian on Steam. And I'm still itching to to to, to hit that buy button. Like folks, if you remember Homeworld at all or go check Total Biscuits past broadcast from today either on on twitch or me and he might even have it up on youtube now go and check out his his run through of of um home world remastered it's f- phenomenally beautiful and, and thankfully for people who want to go back and haven't seen it there are no spoilers in the storyline if you've never played it he did two skirmish matches so uh you get to see him stomp the ai and then the ai stomp a mud oh. on him <laughs> Big time did it stomp him. <laughs> it was oh, hilarious. Man, he it was he never got ended. wrecked. He just literally got wrecked. Um, while we're on the subject of new games, we got a couple of um, trailers out today. One for Dungeon Dungeons Two. Um, yes. Dungeons One uh, was it, it's it's basically what it, it's like um, Dungeon Keeper. Yep. Type, it's a type game. It's Dungeons One is a spiritual successor to, to um, Dungeon Keeper, and 
what they're saying, and some people I see in the reviews, um, this is like the Dungeon Keeper sequel that people are waiting for, this one. I want to talk to you in a minute, Arno, about that too. So hang, hang tough. Anyway, this is a trailer for Dungeons 2. So you guys can kind of get a look. It's not very long. It's only, what, 39? One minute. minute 39? Yeah, minute 39. So here, here's, here's a look at Dungeons 2. After years of lurching in the dungeon, after years of digging in the dirt, the time has come to take it to the next level. Build your dungeon. <coughs> Raise your army. Stand your ground. And take theirs. No, I haven't, Nick. I'm not a big fan of those type of games. Dungeons 2. So, coming April 2015. There you go, folks. There you have it. That is now. I remember when Dungeons One came out. There was a bit of an uproar due to the amount of microtransactioning that was happening in that game, and it was pissing a lot of people off. Like Dark, do you? Do you remember what, like, because we, we were hanging around in TeamSpeak when that launched, and we, we had a big discussion about that, didn't we? I don't think I've ever heard of Dungeons. Really? Yeah. I know of Dwarf Fortress, but not Dungeons. No, I, I think that, uh, like, right. I played Dungeons, and it wasn't, it, there is, even saying, people saying in chat, it was a horrible game. It wasn't perfect. It, it, it wasn't kind of what people were hoping it would be. I, I think a lot of people put a little too much stock and in, in hype on it. Um, but like, I, I actually went to GOG and bought the original two. to Because um, I, I remember playing them back in the day, and they're fun. The only problem is a lot of the control schemes do not hold up. They're, they're not very intuitive now, if you look at what a lot of these uh, types of games use. So... But it's still, like, Dungeon Keeper 2 really holds up uh, gameplay-wise. Um, so if if they can match that kind of, like, video game gold that Dungeon Keeper and Dungeon Keeper 2 had uh, with Dungeons 2, uh, like, I, I'm going to be all over it. I, I, I love these types of games. I, I know you like playing these type of games, Dark. Like, well, actually, you like playing a lot of different types of games for, you know, for one as young as you are. Um... What do you think of this one? Does this one appeal to you at all? Um, I'm not sure. It eh. That it, type of game has, that kind of design to a game has never really appealed to me. That kind of dig your cavern from a third isometric type of view. I've seen plenty of games do it, something like that, but I've never been interested. Hmm. Okay, the other one that arrived, uh, actually, and there's a tactics demo uh, that's coming to Steam. It was uh, for a Kickstarter game called War Machine Tactics, um, a game of steam-powered robots and elite warriors in raging battles dominated by magic and mechana. Uh, developer Pri Privateer Press Interactive asked for $550,000 to convert the War Machine tabletop game into a turn-based tactical PC game and end up with nearly triple that amount. Um, 
the demo is going to offer three of the 20 available levels in the single player game as well as a skirmish mode and access to the um, multiplayer matches including against owners of the full game but with limited squad building options. Uh, customizable loadouts of four, for four of the game's six main factions are included. It, now this, this ties in with what we were talking about the other day about playable, properly playable demos. And it looks like, uh, and this this is the trailer for it, so have a look, folks, and, and see, see, see what you think. Lieutenant Journeyman Allison Jakes, this tribunal has convened in accordance with... It's a story trailer. Law ...to assist the ongoing inquest into the unknown whereabouts of Commander Dalen Sturgis. Commander Sturgis is dead, Your Honor. We were on our own, and every soldier had accepted his fate. We would succeed at our mission, or die trying. Strong female character, too. There we go. Yeah. Anita Sarkeesy would be proud. Oh, yeah, and she's actually <laughs> got a full kind of armor uniform on, you know, hey. They're getting a, it. A novel idea. Yeah. So anyway, I guess I guess the demo is available now on on Steam. Hello, Allison. Now, granted, that's just a um, stop, you stupid. Oh, um, get rid of that for a second. Um, granted, it's a demo. Um, and you really, it's really only, there's like, there's no gameplay. It's all about this, the story for, as far as, as, um, yeah, you're right. Or, or no, she probably would if she wasn't out LARPing right now. Um, what do you think guys? It looks interesting. I, I'm actually going to give it a shot because it, it, it's War Machine. I, I think they're saying it was a miniatures game as well. Yeah. The script monkey mentioned. So it, miniatures were never interested in me because of the deep financial investment a lot of them had like a hundred to two hundred dollars just to start um but I, i'm gonna give the, the the demo a run because it this is probably one of the more fuller featured demos i've heard of in a long time a long time a very long time so I, i'll be all over this one just to give it a shot and, and uh get my thoughts on it what about you dark looks interesting Definitely, I'll try out the dinner demo, but I don't know. Uh, just from that video, it was all cinematic, no yeah. gameplay. So, um, no, yeah, it really doesn't even say much in in the post about it either, uh, other than the fact um, for those who already own War Machine Tactics and are digging it appropriately, there is a uh, DLC that just got released for it as well today. Uh, the expansion adds an entirely new faction to the game that includes eight new units. Uh, Don, Donlor, Viros, Hydra, Manticore, Gorgon, Dongard, Invictor, Dongard, Sentinel, and so on and so forth. Um, a bug fix update to the game was released alongside the new DLC, but the announcement acknowledges that a rather large number of known in issues remain uns unresolved. So it's not a perfect game by any stretch of the imagination, but what got me, and I don't know if you were you were listening when we were talking about this the whole demo thing. I'm kind of interested in, in your in in your your opinion, Dark, because I know you try a lot of games. Would you be more willing to give a game a chance if they actually had a really good playable full like not just a crippled demo, but something like this, where you can actually play a proper game to get a feel for the feel for what it's like. Uh, definitely. Like, I there are tons of games I just pass over and forget about pretty much forever because I can't actually play them. 
because I don't have the money at the time. What's your feelings on demos in general? Like, I, as far as I'm concerned, demos for the, for the longest while now have been basically useless. Yeah, the problem is right now, uh, no real demos exist. If the combination of demos and uh, stream slash YouTube are the perfect storm for never having to, having to buy a bad game again. You get to try out the game yourself, and then you get to watch someone actually play the game. Yeah. Well, it's like, I, I know Karate is getting really heavy into Elite Dangerous, and she's been playing the hell out of the demo. Now, granted, the demo for Elite Dangerous is just one of the combat modules, which is fine. It gives you a good sample of it. And there's, there's lots of streamers out there right now that are streaming it, and there's lots on YouTube that are, are doing it. So it's meeting, I, and I agree with you. I, I think that for companies like, like you know, uh, Privateer Press, who are doing this full featured of a demo, are showing the right way to do things. And I would encourage any game maker out there to follow this. Because you've got gamers like Dark, you've got gamers like Reg, who want to want to love your game, right? But you're not giving us a way to do it. You're asking us to pony up anywhere from thirty to to sixty bucks on the women of prayer that you're not going to fuck us. Now, I think consoles are one of the few bastions of demos right now. Like that's where you're gonna see the most of them because I've, um, I've lost count of how many times I've gone on uh, my my 360 and pulled up a demo for something just to get a feel for it. Like, um, it Kingdoms of Amalur, which uh, it had parts of it that really made me interested because it's one of my favorite authors. Ari Salvatore was a part of it. Todd McFarlane did the art on it. I'm like, for me, this is a perfect storm. So and. I did try the demo, never got a chance to buy it, but my father, who I know have similar tastes in RPGs, and we both read the same books and everything, so I'm like, you know what? I played the demo, it's really good, I know what you like, and I know you're going to love it. And he bought it and had a great time with it. Yeah. So, By, and, by the way, I, I just want to make note, Guardian, it's good to see you back here, dude. Uh, um, Guardian is a game developer. He's, awesome. He's worked on some, some major titles. And he says it's it's so expensive to make a demo, though. I understand that. I, I understand that there is an inherent expense. Mm. But wouldn't you rather incur that expense on the possibility that you're going to make some gamers very happy enough and happy enough that they're going to be willing to part with their money to buy your full game? I would hope so, because you know what, a demo, if it is expensive, and Guardian, thanks for bringing that up, um, if, if it is such a cost to it, roll that into your marketing budget, if you have one, because a demo is marketing, it, it is, it's the equivalent of taking a, a, you know, an alpha or beta or, you know, a demo to, uh, uh, you know, a, a big convention like PAX or, or GDC or what have you. It's getting that out there and getting people's um, people's eyes and hands on it, and that, that's one of the more important things because you want people to get a taste of it, so that they can say, "Hey, I love this game," and they tell their friends about it, and that's how you get your word out. Aside from advertising in general. Yeah, I, I'm just out of curiosity, and I'm, I'm not even sure if logistically it could be done. But let's say, like for example, this. Privateer Press uh, company and, and their their demo that they put out. Would you be willing to let's say fork over two dollars for it, if that money was then put against the final price of the game? Should you buy it? You're out two bucks, and you've got a demo that you can play for basically as long as you want. But it's it's it. This is maybe one way they they can recoup part of that cost. I don't... Hey, Ginger! Good to see you, sweetheart! Yes, you're back in town. Good to see you. Um, what do you think of that? Like, would that even be a reasonable thing to do? What do you think, Dark? Uh, 
Yeah. Like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's, yeah. no, it's, it's, it's a simple, it was a simple question, it was a, you know, it's a simple, what do you, what about you, Red? Uh, yeah, I think the $2 mark would be as high as I'd be willing to fork over. It, it's kind of like in that, that mobile app level where you don't think too much about it, and if it's a demo where there's no time restriction, yes. If it's, you get 30 minutes to an hour to play, and yeah, you're spending no, two bucks, no. Hell no. 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 Like, I really like what Privateer Press is doing here. Like, you're getting a good, solid playing experience, you know, to be able to judge the value of the game. And someone I saw was, was uh, let me just scroll back up here in chat, because someone was actually, Nick. Nick B says he's downloading it right now. You know, um, so Nick, let us know what you think of the game tomorrow. You know, because I, I would be really, you know, curious what your opinion is, whether what, and whether the that demo presentation is something that impressed you enough that you're willing to buy the game. A um, little bit of fun up here next, okay? Um, and the only reason is, is it, it, this the only reason it really comes in is because it's related to. Final Fantasy. Now, apparently, this guy, he, he, uh, his fiance is a Final Fantasy nut bar. She loves Final Fantasy. Anything Final Fantasy, she's into it. So, um, for a recent episode of Super Builds, uh, Super Fan Builds, uh, designer and master builder Tim Baker and his team at Tim Baker Creations uh created uh a final fantasy kitchen knife set complete with uh mass masamune squall's gunblade cloud's buster sword and oren's katana all in to be kept in an ocus knife stand so just for a little fun because, you know, it's Friday. Screw you if you don't want a little bit of fun, but I do. Um, if I can find what screen I'm on here, here is Final Fantasy Kitchen Knives. The whole world gone crazy! Am I the only one around here who gives a shit about the rules? Thanks, Zebra. Zebra. Every super fan dreams of having that ultimate collectible. Well, we're about to make those dreams come true. This is Super Fan Builds. I'm Tim Baker. I've been a master builder and prop maker in film and television for 25 years. If you can dream it, we can build it. There's nothing my crew exactly, can't Ginger. make. Exactly, Ginger. You got her, sweetheart. Tim, our show is called Super Fan Builds, but I think we might have a super super fan. Her name is Brittany, and she loves with capital letters all around, all things Final Fantasy. She's been nominated by her boyfriend, Matt. Let's see his video. Hi, my name is Matt Key. I'd like to nominate my girlfriend, Brittany Wallach. Brittany is the definition of a Final Fantasy super fan. She's Every scary looking, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Even scarier with that big buster sword. The only reason I know that is because I've seen her play Final Fantasy IX. Every single time Phoebe's on screen, um, she cries. Her alarm music when she wakes up is the prelude to Final Fantasy. She wants to walk down the aisle to that at our wedding. She also loves cooking, so if you guys could find I like a this way lady. to combine those two loves of hers, <laughs> that would be just about the best gift I think she could get as a super fan of Final Fantasy. For this build, we're making a Final Fantasy kitchen knife set, with each blade being one of the most iconic swords from the Final Fantasy game series. One of the fun things about this build is that we'll be doing it along with Matt and Carrie Zagler over at Baltimore Knife and Sword. The four that we're going to be doing are the Masamuni, Squall's Gunblade, Cloud's Buster Sword, and Oran's Katana. Now, all four of the pieces then are going to be stored in a knife block that's based on Ultras, the carnivorous octopus character. We have the sketches done for the Final Fantasy swords, and they're ready to send over to Matt and Carrie. We received our CAD drawings for the Final Fantasy knife set. They look really good. Can't wait to get these cut and ground. 
For these blades, we decided to use 1084 high carbon steel. This will allow the edges to stay sharper longer, and that's exactly what we need for a cutlery set. After grinding, we heat treated and polished the blades out, put them in a box, and shipped them out to Tim Baker. Can't wait to see what he does cut, with them. I was going to jump through we'll this, but I figured I'm just going to let it roll. You guys the next look like you're enjoying this, so we'll just let it and roll. And the I love guards. this kind of stuff. Turn Sons of really, Guns is really another really one, nice. too. The first sword we'll be working on is Sephiroth's Masamune. I have drawn the design for the Suba. I'm going to get it here on the brass. With I love it, the excessively long sword. Yeah. <laughs> like, these are kitchen subway. knives, man, that they're making, but like, it's like, <laughs> what the hell? I love you know, when people do stuff like this. You know, it, it's dark. You now have an idea for next Mother's Day. <laughs> I've got this piece cut out, and I'm ready to solder this closed. Like, you gotta admire the craftsmanship that it is, goes into, because I watched the handles are prior, a type of leather more most made of it anyway, sharks, and Masamone, I'll be amazing using craftsmanship. Now, our ray skin is black, and Masamune is white. So I am going to bring out some of the highlights and the bumps of this ray skin by blotting the enamel on there. I have started the wrap for Masamune Sephiroth sword and it is looking so beautiful. The little diamonds that show between the wraps. Look at that contrast. The light and dark. That is one hell of a long kitchen knife though. <laughs> While Shani is finishing up the Matsumune, I'm going to be working on Cloud's Buster Sword. I'm going to be putting two different finishes on this blade, so the edge is going to be highly polished, and then the uh, flat part here, that's going to be uh, sandblasted. So I'm just going to clean off all the sand that's still on the blade, and then untape it and see how much of a difference we made. We've changed the texture of the whole blade and we've left that high polish right on that cutting edge. Well, Shani's got the filigree work done, the silver plates in. This is all hand tooled brass and silver for the buster sword. Now I'm getting ready to do the wrap of the handle. I'm just using some magic sculpt and attaching it to the tang here and then I'll fill the inside and that'll hold it in place. Okay, I'm going to wrap the buster sword. I've got the hilt ready, and I'm going to be putting it on with epoxy. I'm wrapping the handle with leather I got from an old jacket. In the game, or on wields a variety of katanas. I choose this design because it's a nice contrast to the others, and I think it would make a great kitchen knife. I am working on the handle for the katana, and I've cut this Victorian flourish out of the brass plate, and I'm getting ready to start carving and getting some detail in it. I'm cutting the base plate for the hilt out of brass and filing it down. I will then solder the two pieces together. With the sword knot attached to the pommel, Oron's katana is complete. The gun blade consists of a sword blade with a gun built into the hilt. The revolver is the gun blade of choice for squall. <laughs> it's the only hard. good thing that came I out of Final Fantasy VIII. The charm for a gun blade, it's a little lion head. This is hard green carving wax. Jewelers use it. I have added some little detail to the main wow. to make something anime feeling. It's a little bit tricky. So I'm used to doing more detailed work, so I had to put the brakes on. Got a lion head. See there? Well, it's I'm definitely a light ray. It's, it's a one of a kind. I'm using some carbon paper to transfer the design of a winged lion onto the blade, just like it is in the game. And then I'll engrave it with a diamond tip engraver. So you think your mom would go for a set like this? There it is. Dark? Now I'm going to buff it out you on the get that for her for, we'll for you know, is. Mother's Day? <laughs> <laughs> Our mom has... Nothing to do with games. Well, I do have a birthday proxy. coming right before Father's Day, so someone make this happen.
You gotta admire the, the talent of these people that do these kind of recreations, you know, like polished, and I've got a clear coat on it. That way we can send it out to get It's unreal. I love this kind of stuff. Like, I think if I had. We've got the gun blade the back forethought the and the chromers. patience I would have done blacksmithing. To match the blade over here. I've got the wooden handles ready to put on, and that's it. I'm working on the knife block for the Final Fantasy swords. This is gonna be Ultros. He's one of the villains in all the games. So I'm carving it out of urethane sculpting foam. It's a great foam to carve in. Coat that with a layer of fiberglass so he'll be good and tough. And the knives will slip right in his head. The tentacles I'm going to do separately. I'm going to carve one of those, do a mold. I'll duplicate that several times and they'll be a soft sculpt. That way we can bend them all over, they can be posable. Oh, shit. I finished the sculpt. I'm doing a plaster cast. So I've divided it in half with clay. I'm just going to lay the plaster in really fast. Then we'll flip it, take the clay out, do plaster on the other side. And then we can start running these out of latex with a soft urethane foam inside. The mold for the tentacle is cured like, and I'm just getting ready to open it up. The creativity. To, to come up with these kind of processes yeah. is absolutely amazing. Yeah, it it's text. like cosplayers. I have the so utmost, to the utmost respect for cosplayers, for man. Piece. Because they can take something that is visual is dry, and turn so it into something real. And oh, yeah. Like, that's that's one of the reasons, like, the, uh, the urethane foam later. I follow punish props. Oh, my God. Like, see the urethane the, to come up. The, the StarCraft the ghost rifle, that guy, the kit, the guy, kit, the guy put yourself. together, is unreal. Big purple dildo. Came out really well. <laughs> so now I'm going to trim it up and get it ready for painting. What link, Arno? What link did you want? Well, we've got the knife block finished up, and I'm really excited to give this to our super fan. More than welcome, Lyra. That's part of what this show is about. Is, is sharing the fun Brady, stuff. We're here today because your brand new fiance, Matt, has convinced us that you are the biggest Final Fantasy fan. It's so I've a, heard, yeah. It's like a lot of convincing, yeah. <laughs> How did you get into Final Fantasy? To this day, there's nothing like Final Fantasy. The stories, the characters, the music. Um, I've never cried during a video game before until I played Final Fantasy VII. There's a connection that I have to that game that I just don't have with others. We have hired Tim Baker here from Tim Baker Creations to make you a one-of-a-kind Final <laughs> Fantasy. Exactly. Exactly, dopey, dropy, dropy. Amazing. Do you have any idea what it could possibly I be? I literally have no idea. I'm super excited about it. So I'm really excited. Yes, perfect about timing. <laughs> Are you ready to see it? Yes, I am. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh. Holy. Oh fuck. my god. No, no. This is your very own Final Fantasy sword knife set. Can I actually cut with these? Everything's sharp and ready to go. Yeah. Oh my god. Watch your like, dick, dude. And the gun she blade. gets pissed <laughs> off at you, and that—that that. is insane. Mind blown. Tim, can you tell her a little bit about how this was made? Well, we teamed up with the Baltimore Knife and Sword folks. Yes, you should not get your girlfriend if her steel. last name is we Bobbit. Yes. <laughs> with Soren's katana, it's brass, leather. It's all hand fabricated. We have Cloud's Buster Sword. It's all pure silver and hand fabricated brass and bronze tips. Matsumune, and it's uh, real stingray skin, and the gun blades chromed with almost an ounce of silver in the charm at the end. Tim, this is a masterpiece. I'm just floored. Thank you so much. You're I'm welcome. so honored. Best <laughs> engagement gift ever. By far. It's the coolest <laughs> thing in my house now. Well, there you have it. Another satisfied super fan. If you have a super fan that you want to nominate, contact us at superfanbuilds at break.com. Right, right here. Oh, I can't wait to have this, a centerpiece at my wedding. This is going to be awesome. A centerpiece at her wedding. We've been assembling this. Anyway, that that's that was just for, for a little bit of fun, folks. I, I, I hope you enjoyed it because I... It, it's, you know, it, it, it it's not typical, you know, gaming stuff, but it's gaming related, and that's what we love talking about. Um, speaking of gaming related, you put this one in the show notes. Um, why the Super Mario movie is an underappreciated masterpiece. Now, please fucking explain that to me, because <laughs> there is no way that... Super Mario movie was a masterpiece. Okay, it was. That, it, it was not. <laughs> I I agreed with that. I saw this. I'm like, they're they're, they're trolling, right? And I started reading, and it's like, 
This isn't. This is legit. Uh, but basically, it's a kind of a long article. I don't want to take you know too much into the, the specifics and a lot of things. Um, but the some of the things they're, they're touching on are like things like the special effects because they in kind of the era that the the puppet work, the special effects, makeup, all the stuff that they did was actually really well done. Even if the characters they depicted weren't exactly accurate to what the fans would have wanted. Um, and yes, Ron, the, the Bob Hoskins one, and that one of the things they said is Bob Hoskins as Mario was uh, one of the things, like, they, they say, complain all you want about Luigi's lack of mustache, but you can't deny that casting Bob Hoskins as Mario was a stroke of genius. He nails the accent, manages to make the a well-developed character out of what was essentially written as a two-dimensional cartoon. Um, and, and for those of you who are maybe, like, dark and might not have been old enough to remember who framed Roger Rabbit. He was awesome in that movie too. Yes, so, he, yes, he was. Yeah, that was an awesome movie. That was a uh, ground groundbreaking movie, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, go go yeah. ahead, go ahead. Uh, the next thing you said, haven't you haven't you have not convinced me yet, <laughs> and I don't well, think you convinced Dark because he's not looking convinced at all. <laughs> I'm still half only half convinced in this. Uh, they're saying that the as well the the girl who plays Daisy is really cute, which I'll give them. It's a cute, uh, uh, pouty lips, big eyes, hot eyebrows. She's like my dream girl, except not cheating on me with a twenty four year old guitarist from an underground emo band. Uh, I give him, I give the guy a pass on that line alone. Um, this is actually as well, and the one thing that they poked at next was it gave John Leguizamo his start, which. For me, it was kind of a big thing because I remember watching The Pest and watching the crap out of that movie because I thought it was hilarious. And, you know, he's done some bigger roles like, you know, Romeo and Juliet later on and, and, and uh, Moulin Rouge. So it, it kind of jump started his career and it kind of had like a Polly Shore effect initially and then he kind of grew yeah, into it. Yeah, that's no recommendation. That's no compare. Like, Polly Shore. At Pauly least he didn't disappear. <laughs> well, Polly Shore movies were funny, but he just. Disappear. No, they weren't. I thought they were. But, but then again, that's my sense of humor. Go ahead. Keep um, going. I'm still not convinced. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they, they actually had, like, because Mario's supposed to be a plumber, and they're saying he actually does some actual goddamn plumbing. So it wasn't just a shtick. He actually got out of Basin Ranch and just started working on the pipe. So... You know what? Like they actually got a little legitimacy in in the plumber business there. Uh, one of the things I think was actually even more important was the, the political satire they had the the whole Koopa, um, the, the like the propaganda posters, like the Koopa the environmentalist, where he's holding a chainsaw in, in the image. So not exactly someone who would be running for Greenpeace. But um, it, it kind of gets that Nazi's propaganda feel to it. And, uh, of course, everyone knows Mario and Luigi, but it's like, well, what's their last name? Oh, no, 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 no one knows. So apparently we figured that out through this movie, is it's Mario Mario and Luigi Mario. Because Mario couldn't... Yeah, it, apparently Mario is the last name, because it is the Mario Brothers. But... It never made sense because the Mario brothers are Luigi and Mario. So you think, well, is Mario the last name? Is it just Mario's first name? Is it the brothers, the, the redheaded stepchild of the family? Like, what's going on? So, yeah, it, it was kind of a weird thing. Okay, explain and, the Goombas, okay? Like, seriously. <laughs> the Goombas, you know what? As a kid watching this, and I agree with the article, or a wee bit freaky like a, a little no bit scary shit because you're, you're thinking this okay this is a little mushroom with eyes and two feet like <sighs> it kind of was a little bit much having these big tank like looking guys with this little itty bitty head <laughs> um but i, I think again it, they're, they're saying here is, is the the goomas are a case of special effects done too well Despite limited surface area of their faces, the Goombas are capable of expressing pretty much every emotion known to man. This is kind of cool, but it's also kind of terrifying. I'm not even sure if this is necessarily one of the movie's good points, but it bears mentioning nonetheless. 
Uh, and I do agree with them. Uh, the set design, you're saying that the sets like those to Super Mario Brothers really makes me miss the 90s. It was at a time when CGI was too expensive and risky to use in great quantities, thus requiring the use of practical sets and special effects. Uh, I think we should probably get a link in here because some of the images to, will help with that part. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to see if... Yeah, okay, yeah, here we got it. I got it. Uh, I, got, I got the link. I was saying, honestly, look at that city. It's only used in about two scenes, but it's extremely, extremely detailed on a Blade Runner kind of level. Neon lights, huge crowds, big buildings. After films like Mario Brothers and Dark City, this kind of set workmanship doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so the... Like, that's the one thing I didn't even think about, and they, he brings it up. I'm like, okay, yeah, they did kind of get a really good look to the set. Um, and no, I just got to go. So, and then some of the, they say some of the dialogue is pretty funny. Um, again, the writing team wasn't AAA on this, this movie. Duh. Um, so I'm kind of going to pass on that one in particular. Um, the fact that, that Dennis Hopper actually signed up to play a giant evil lizard. Yes. Okay, that's the one redeeming feature of this movie. All right. Yes. Is Dennis Hopper looking like an evil lizard? That works. Yeah, and even the and in terms of the special effects, and kind of roll back to it. Um, the. They actually have it marked here is the grossest prop slash character ever designed. Uh, it's when the um, the old Mushroom King was de-evolved uh, um, by King Koopa, or essentially killed. He basically reverted him to his primordial state of fungus, and this big, kind of weird, alienish blob of crud, and. It, it, I'm going to agree. It was kind of gnarly to look at. Um, like, I'll tell you right now, you, you're not you're not pulling in any any real love from from chat on this one. Like, they're they're just they're not they're not seeing this. And I, I know this movie was a train wreck, but it was still fun. But this guy's trying hard, and I'm giving him credit at least on that. Um, the leisure suits, the red and yellow leisure suits for Mario and Luigi. Come on, that's class, All right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I do fucking think so. <laughs> it wasn't even class but, when they were made the first time around. <laughs> yeah, I know that is Miami Vice level <laughs> bad. Um, one of the, a couple of the few things that they, they kind of pulled off really well is the kind of the bombs. I remember as a kid when they dropped one of those things, I was losing my mind because of these little tiny things that they're throwing in. Okay, just one second. Dark, your homework for this weekend is to find a copy of the Super Mario Brothers movie, watch it, and report back to us your impressions as a modern kid of how great this movie is, okay? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know that sounds like punishment, right? Like, what, yeah. what, what, what the fuck did I do to deserve this shit? <laughs> <laughs> but, like, the, the, the next thing that we were talking about, too, is Yoshi. Now, how do you translate a cartoony dinosaur into something like this? They kind of nailed it off. Like, it looks like a mini raptor. Um, and, you know, his main kind of thing, his main shtick is his long tongue. And... How he, he's this, uh, the author here writes it, um, and at least he has one of his abilities from the game, his long tongue, and he actually uses it to help Daisy. He tri is tripping up Koopa's bitch of a wife and helps Daisy escape. So they did get that and try to kind of work around it. Other kind of small things like that look at, <laughs> like, kind of a recall, <laughs> and did, like, it was one of those did not notice, but uh, kind of. <laughs> Interesting note now. The de evolution gun was just a spray painted Super Scope 6. So it's one of those things that I owned one and I should have picked that one up. Why, uh, thank you, Damien. I really appreciate that compliment. <laughs> uh, an awkward pre 9 11 use of the World Trade Center 
uh, towers in a destructive capacity. So uh, that one's a little rough. Look, uh, okay, and, all right, all right. Yeah, it's we got the point. <laughs> You're trying very, very hard to find some socially redeeming value out of a schlock movie. Yes. Okay. And that, that the guy was really reaching on a lot of this. I, I give him some points in some things here and there, like uh, the special effects, the, the set design. Yes. yes. I, okay, granted. But this is not a socially redeeming movie. It is not a no. masterpiece. It is not anywhere <laughs> close. Regardless of how much Ginger Snaps is going to rip my head off tomorrow, okay, this is not a fucking masterpiece of a movie. And I, no, I, I, I take back the assignment, Dark, because like Script Monkey says, I don't want, I don't want to be mean to you. You're just that, that is yeah. leveling on child abuse. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so consider yourself, you know, saved from that 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 curse. Um, <laughs> Ginger, consider this my my one and only troll article for the chat. <laughs> And, and and you see, Ginger, she's already she's already after me. You know, don't you hate on my masterpiece? I'll beat you. Uh, yeah, that could be fun too. Um, anyway, <laughs> we are going long again, and this is becoming a regular routine. But we will be calling the show to a close tonight, folks. At uh, at this point, I want to thank everybody in chat, even the asshole Damien, for dropping by, and. <laughs> Uh, you know, joining with us, enjoying the show, talking with us, chatting amongst yourselves, and, and contributing a great conversation to the show. Um, we will be back again tomorrow night at 12 a.m., as always. And we'll see who we, we, we might pull in for our guest host at that point. But for tonight, thank you, Dark. I think you actually, you're booked for tomorrow night, aren't you? Yep. Yep. -er. Oh, okay. So you know what? Maybe we can talk Ginger into in into co-hosting. Ginger, you're gonna be around tomorrow, eh? Mm-hmm. Um so thank you, Dark, very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Red Mage, for jumping oh, in God and then thank you, Nick, for following. Um, this has been Late Night with Cranky and Friends. Thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you tomorrow. But in the meantime, remember, the most important, the Wolfgang's got the clue. The Thank you, Wolfgang. Remember, folks, game on. <laughs>